Today we're talking to the big guy, not Joe Biden in this case. <laughs> this time it's Eric Cortina, the real big guy. You know, you're kind of okay at shooting, a little bit of a world champion. And so when I watch through some of the things that you've taught me, that you've showed on your YouTube channel about accuracy, and you're doing some things that are very unconventional, it perks my ears a little bit. So thanks for sitting down with us. Yeah, man. Thanks for having me. First thing that you do that is very unconventional that I don't usually hear, especially from somebody who's a precision long range shooter is you don't do any barrel break in. I don't. I mean, people have their crazy systems, you know, shoot two shots clean, three shots clean. Everybody has a little bit of a different recipe, but you're doing nothing. How could that possibly be? Obviously I've done barrel break in and then I've done no barrel break in. And over time I realized I could not see a difference at all. And as you know, I, I do a lot of shooting. So, and I know a lot of contacts, my, you know, barrel manufacturers, I shoot for Brooks barrels. And, uh, one day I just called them up and said, Hey, let me ask you a question. You guys recommend barrel break in. If somebody sends you a barrel back that doesn't shoot, how can you tell whether the barrel was broken in or not? And he says, well, we can't. I said, so there is no visible or measurable difference whether I break it in or not. He said, no. I said, so am I wasting my time? I mean, seems like it. And he says, yeah, we, it doesn't matter. I said, well, you guys recommend it. And he says, well, we recommend it because people expect that we give them a breaking procedure. They kept asking for one, so we had to give them something. So <laughs> I said, okay. So that's when I stopped. You know, I had already kind of stopped breaking in barrels. But it's one of those things that people expect to have a procedure. So a lot of times the barrel manufacturers just come up with one just so that the customer spin around twice, dance and yeah. jump all around, and suddenly your barrel will shoot. So speaking of being tough on barrels, um, you're cleaning those barrels with CLR, like the commercial, very, very acidic acid. Um, that you're putting down barrels, and it makes people freak out in uh, in your videos when you're showing people how you're cleaning barrels. They're like, do not touch a barrel with that. But clearly, it's working because you're winning championships after doing that. So. All I have is stainless steel barrels. I have never used it on anything else. Uh, so that's that. And I don't, I literally run three wet patches through there. And then I run isopropyl alcohol, like 99%, just to get that CLR out of there. And then I go to town with my conventional cleaning supplies. Uh, and I found that CLR gets that carbon out really fast. And it makes it really soft. I bet. Really easy to get. So, again, don't leave it in there uh, overnight. Don't, don't just, literally it stays in there for like five minutes. But it gets it out quick. I like it. Now, speaking of cleaning, we're going to talk about not cleaning brass at all later, which is one that absolutely fascinates me. But first, this video is sponsored by Arena Breakout, who provided me early access to their awesome new game. Arena Breakout is a brand new tactical first-person shooter, and a first-of-its-kind extraction looter shooter. This is like Tarkov Mobile at its best. Now, obviously, as gun enthusiasts, and this video is about accuracy, we're in it for the guns. In the gunsmith section, you'll find 10 attachment slots and over 700 mods for the guns. A longer barrel is going to give you more accuracy in the game. The AKs are really good, but in this game, I like the M4A1, and I'd pick an LPVO because it allows you to make those long shots accurately, but also quick target acquisition. You can change out the grips, barrel length, everything you'd want to know. The tip I'd have for you is if you're getting stuck, just think of real life. You don't just put on a scope, you gotta make sure you got a pick rail already. Arena Breakout is available right now for download on the Google Play and Apple App Store in the United States. Click on the link in the video description to download the game today, and stay tuned for more exciting updates by following Arena Breakout's official channels. Tell me a little bit about bullet pointing. So I hear a lot of um, shooters in different disciplines as they're trying to decide, you know, you got a box of bullets, which ones are gonna shoot the best for when I take this long range shot or this competition? Tell me a little about, about bullet pointing and how realistically, what kind of improvement could you actually see? Well, you will get a BC improvement, but how much, I don't really know. I mean, it's at a thousand yards, I get about a half to three quarter MOA on target. Uh, however, the reason that we 
point bullets is for BC consistency, not so much for BC gains. Consistency is key. And uh, that's the reason we do bullet points. So how, what does the process look like to do that? Well, you, uh, you, you, uh, you get a die, a bullet pointing die. There's multiple companies that make them. And you literally just run your die or your bullet into the die, and the, the die will put a pointier point on it. Now, you can, they sell different inserts. Uh, you can point different levels. You can point whatever. I mean, this is one of those things that you can spend a lot of time on. But a very important thing here is you can actually ruin bullets by pointing them, right? There's a very fine line in which it's helping you. So to point bullets, this is one of those things that you need to look at after Everything else has been figured out in a way. I don't know. Like, for example, for me, uh, you know, I can take about a five to six inch group at a thousand yards down into about three inches by point, point. Okay, so we're, we're talking about some of the very fine details as you're pointing out here. Let's pause f- just a second from the title of the, you know, the six unconventional secrets. And let's, let's just put into place a few of those just super keys. You know, if you take somebody who's just very much a hobbyist but really wants to shoot accurately, they jump out of their truck with their setup and go to shoot with you. What are maybe three or four of the things that you're going to want to fix right away from what the average shooter does? Their form. So tell me about form. What would be some specific things that you'd want to make sure they're doing? Well, obviously, they need to be stable. They need to be calm. Calm is a big one because you can't be stable if you're not calm. And... uh, and they just need to have good form. Uh, you know, natural point of aim is a big one. That, that's, you know, I see a lot of shooters try to, they kind of get on target and they're off. And instead of moving their whole body to line everything up, they just move the rifle. And now it's mm-hmm. not lined up. So the first time it recoils, it's going to, they just created a hinge point. And it's going to jump all over. And they're just going to think it's the rifle. So recoil management is a big one. And that falls under form. Uh, obviously, how to break the trigger, when to break the trigger, uh, breathing, vision, sight picture. There's a lot in form, uh, and that's why we do a lot of dry firing. So when you're shooting in a precision match like F-Class that you shoot, um, so I we've got a bipod up front or some kind of front rest, and then we've got a rear bag, right, under the back of the rifle. And um, often I hear from backfire fans as they're, uh, as they're you know, saying, ah, I've got accuracy problems, I'm not shooting well. Almost every time the first question I ask is, what was your rear rest? <laughs> and so often the answer is my hand. You know, <laughs> I've got a bipod and I use my hand at, at the back. And um, it it that rear rest contributes so much to how stable you are it's like that is a huge key and so if you don't have a rear rest sandbag that is absolute key even for just testing your hunting rifle to see how well the ammo shoots you've got to have some kind of rear rest you want to isolate the shooter as much as possible you need the rifle to be as stable as possible every time Seems like every time I post a video of how we actually shoot with the front rest and the rear bag, people say, well, the shooter's not doing anything. It's it's all supported. We're doing a lot. But the objective is to actually have the rifle as stable as possible because that's going to tell you how good the rifle shoots, not how good you shoot. Obviously, <laughs> it's all mixed together right it's one system so isolate as many things as possible and yeah rear bag the front you know you have gonna have a good bipod or a front rest or whatever and recoil management all that what's your preference for a front rest i use sebs sebastian seb uh but you know that's for my f glass stuff competition that i do but for uh, prs and hunting i I just use a bipod, a good solid bipod. Okay, so the next one has been a subject of controversy. It is uh, barrel tuners. You were nice enough last time I shot with you to give me one of your tuners, uh, the awesome EC tuner brake. It is so well crafted. It, it feels like a fine piece of machinery. You're doing an awesome job with that. 
So, um, and in, I, I call this an unconventional secret of accuracy because there is some degree of, of controversy uh, in, the, in the industry about barrel tuners. The idea, and correct me if I'm wrong, is that you essentially, you're, you're moving the weight out front to different levels that can affect the way that the barrel whips, the harmonics of that barrel as the bullet is going down the barrel. Now, the skeptic would say that it's not, it's not enough to improve the accuracy. And there have been some tests by Brian Litz and uh, his, uh, his book, Advancements in Long Range Shooting, I think version three, uh, I have somewhere around me. Yeah, I have it. Um, I where just, it's just he out said, of reach, but yeah, I have it here. <laughs> yeah, where he said he couldn't, he wasn't able to find in big data uh, that it was shooting, the, uh, that it was showing a difference. However, world champion. <laughs> um, and, uh, and so it's something that it leaves people wondering, uh, about it. And so I, I, I don't, I don't really know. This isn't really my game and I have not even got the opportunity to shoot this yet. And so I don't have an opinion, opinion one way or the other, but it is something that when I see something, uh, unique in accuracy, I'm always skeptical until I can actually see it myself. So tell me, tell to somebody that who hasn't shot a barrel tuner, what they could expect and, and, and what the theory is behind it. So a uh, barrel tuner tunes the harmonics of your barrel. Your barrel's shaking. It's doing all kinds of things when you shoot. And uh, it moves the, that weight back and forth so that you can tune that barrel on the exit point. So imagine a swing, right? And uh, let's say you're, you're playing dodgeball and somebody's on the swing and you're trying to hit that target. The point that's easiest to hit is when it reverses direction because it's going to stop for a minute second. Mm -hmm. Well, barrels do a similar thing. So you're trying to time the bullet exit to where the barrel switches direction so that that's going to be the most consistent point possible. Now, does it work? And this is where the controversy comes in, right? Just like just like ammo, right? You you take match ammo and you say this is match ammo it's going to shoot better it doesn't work in every system possible right it's been optimized but it doesn't mean it works on everything and also not every gun is a quarter moa gun so if you put a tuner on your rifle and it shoots different it, it's already working now is it working to your expect expectations? Possibly not, but if it changes what it does, you know, what your barrel or what your gun does, then it's working. Now, typically, I mean, we sell tons of tuners, and we have a lot of feedback from customers, and it has helped literally thousands of people finally get to where they're going. Now, we also have a series, back to the Needs More series, and the biggest improvement that we made on those $600 rifles was putting tuners on them. Yeah, you know, that's an, that's an interesting point because it seems to me, and correct me if I'm wrong, but I would think this would be true, that although, you know, a, a hunting rifle, a lot is going to get lost in the noise because there's just not nearly as much accuracy as a, as a, as a heavy competition rifle. However... A hunting rifle's barrel is generally a lot lighter profile, um, and so if anything would ben benefit from a tuner, it honestly seems like that would be the most likely scenario where you would see that difference. Right. Is that correct? correct? Now, we've all heard about free-floating barrels. Yeah, which means that the stock is not touching the barrel. Yeah, There's and that the reason free-floating is beneficial is because the stock is not touching the barrel, right? You, it's inducing harmonics or bad harmonics. Uh, so you want to isolate the barrel so it just does its thing. That's number one. And then once it's doing its own thing, then you can add a tuner to tune those harmonics. Cool. Well, I'm excited to try it out. I, it, it's a really innovative product. I like it. Okay, so tell me a little bit about brass cleaning. So I can make what is this? <laughs> some pretty precise ammo. Um, you know, when I go through my full system for creating ammo that I'm showing in my reloading course, you can get down to some tiny, tiny SDs and make some really good ammo. But it takes too freaking long. And there are so many steps in with ammo that 
we don't know for sure that it's going to make a difference here, but there's that potential that it could make a difference. So you think about, you shoot, you shoot, shoot a lot of brass, and then you're gonna reload. Well, there's a little bit of powder residue left in that case, right? And you know, that's where you would, you would clean it. And you, you can see it in there. The theory being, if you didn't clean it, well, that residue is by a minute amount changing the volume, the interior volume of that brass. And so you'd need to clean it so that you get a consistent result. But again, it's like, Eric, you just have, you just have the best argument for everything because you can just be like, scoreboard, it's working. <laughs> Believe the target. <laughs> so tell me why I can, uh, tell me why I can save some time and just not clean brass. And is there a point where it could become dangerous that it, uh, there's just too much crap in that brass? I guess if the brass lasted long enough for it to become, to get that kind of a buildup, it would become dangerous. But brass, number one, doesn't last that long. 10, 15 firings. I've heard people shoot them a lot more, but th that buildup that we talk about, it's not that much. I don't, it's, I guess you could measure it, but it's, it's very negligible. So back to, mm -hmm. I, you know, I used to clean brass all the time. That, that was one of my things that I always did because I always wanted to, I wanted to build the ammo exactly like I had done the previous one, right? Keep everything the same. Mm -hmm. uh, but like you just said, it takes a long time. And one day I, I just didn't clean the brass and on target, it was identical. <laughs> and I go, huh, okay, well, let's see how far I can go. Well, I threw away the brass because the primer pockets got too loose before it mattered. And I thought, well, that's one less thing I have to do. Now, the other thing is uh, a benefit to not cleaning brass is that that residue uh, it's on the next, and it acts, acts as a lubricant. And you, I don't know if you ever heard of cold welding, but when the brass is clean and the bullet is clean, they actually like to stick to each other. Well, when you have that fine mm -hmm. layer of carbon, that doesn't happen. Yeah, you know, I saw somebody do some testing, and I, I wish I remember who it was to give them credit, um, but they were using the, you know, the dry lube um, and just lightly lining the, the neck of the case on the interior. And it actually made a significant difference on the SD of the ammo. And so, yeah, I, I, I see what you're saying. It make this really be the same effect. Yeah, and I, I've seen a lot more people ruin brass by cleaning it. You know, they'll, they'll put it in a tumbler, they forget about it, or they get it too clean. This is what I'm talking about. Get it too clean, all of a sudden the bullet stick, it's really hard to seat the bullet. It's just hard to get consistency. So yeah, I quit cleaning. Or leaving brass. it a tiny bit wet. Oh, that's the worst. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I eliminated all those and saved a ton of time. Well, I mean, push me over with a feather. You're telling me I can just save work. I'm in. Uh, honestly, that sounds awesome. That that would save me a few hours every week. So when we I talked to earlier about you know you got your lot of bullets and trying to pick which one uh, to shoot is going to be the most accurate. I talked about uh, sorting by overall length. Um, and so let's say you just made a giant crop of, of ammo. Are you, how are you selecting the winners? This one goes in the competition pile and this one doesn't. Or, no, they're all good, we're going. I have sorted bullets in every which way possible. And, you know, people ask, well, the, what matters most? Is the base to ogive, just the weight sorting, base to tip. You know, if we take this water bottle from here to here. Pretty much where it contacts the yeah, rifle. Yeah, exactly. Or base to tip, from the bottom to the tip of the bullet. And, uh, or by weight, or whatever, you know, bearing surface, uh, bearing surface diameter. There's so many ways you can sort a bullet. The main ones are base to ogive, base to tip. And for the longest time, we were sorting base to ogive, because that's what the experts told us. <laughs> However, the competition shooters, we said, well, let's try base to tip. Okay, so for example, I go back to burger bullets. Weight, super consistent, you're wasting your time weighing them. Base to ogive, super consistent, you're wasting your time doing that. Base to tip, that's where we get the most variance, so we sort by base to tip. And because you, that's where you see mm. the most variance, that's going to show up on target. And now, when I say on target, we're shooting a 1,000 yards. If you're shooting 100, right. I'm going to say if you're shooting 600 and in, just load them and go. Is the reason for that that at distance uh, the BC changes, the tiny changes in the 
in the aerodynamics, let's say, of the bullet are going to show up a big time down, down range at a long distance. But at 100 yards, that tiny little variation you wouldn't notice. Is that correct? Correct. Even five, 600, it's not enough to, to matter. How often do you clean your rifle and what does a lubing policy look like? <laughs> so I clean my rifle every time I use it. 20 shots or 80 or 100 shots, it gets cleaned. Typically in F class, we don't ever go past 100 uh, in one day, but comes back and goes on a, on my table and it gets clean, it goes on a cradle, gets clean, the barrel gets clean, down the barrel metal every time. Uh, I disassemble the bolt every time. Uh, I make sure there's no dirt, no anything, and I use, uh, I use IOSO, lube. IOSO makes lube, it's a triple action lube, whatever, you put it on there, you wipe it off, it cleans and it lubricates. Very, it just leaves a film behind. And uh, I grease the bolt lugs for the action and the ramp, the cocking ramp on the bolt. And that's it. Very little, just enough to function. Now, you said lubing properly. <laughs> I've seen so many that over lube that creates more problems than anything. Because grease will actually slow down your bolt. It, it creates drag. At some point, if you get too much, it'll create drag. And if it gets in front of the, in front of the firing pin where it hits the, bol uh, the bolt, it'll actually create a cushion effect there. And it's just going to give you ignition problems. So um, is the idea between cleaning every time you shoot to protect the barrel or is cleaning every time you shoot the idea that you want the gun to be the same the next time you come and pick it I up? I want it to, both. I want it to be identical every time. And I always say I can keep it consistently clean. I cannot keep it consistently dirty. I, I have a hunting rifle that I keep consistently dirty. Um, it's sometimes different things uh, that I dirty it with. It could be mud today, sand tomorrow, <laughs> whatever, but it's always dirty. <laughs> um, I am kind of interested uh, on that. So I, I totally understand, you know, why you're doing that. It makes total sense. Uh, I'm just kind of curious. So that one's a 6.5 Creedmoor, a Sig Cross. I have about 1,100 shots on it. And I have never cleaned the darn thing, and it's still shooting half him away. It's a, it's a very very accurate rifle for a lightweight hunting rifle, um, and I'm just curious to see when I start to run into into problems with it. And I know that's a different situation than what you're talking about, but I'm just I think it's fascinating to see where the limit is going to be. How far stepped back are you from pressure on a competition rifle? Uh, you know, for example, let's say pressures at 65 grains where where you, or you're seeing pressure signs I should say on your brass at 65 grains there could be actual pressure earlier but you're seeing signs of it on your brass at 65 how far do you where do you step down well, it depends uh, I never want to run up against pressure uh, but it depends because we always looking for the smallest groups possible so if I'm tuning a rifle and the small just the smallest groups is right at pressure I can't shoot there. Mm -hmm. So I have to back it off to the next window where it shoots well. And that may be two, three grains, you know. And, and if it's too far below, then I have to change powders or change something. So, so I, to answer your question, I like to run a, at least a grain below max pressure. That's a grain on my, you know, my max, you know, my typical load is around 57, 58. Now, if you're doing a 223, that may be different. Right. So just don't run up against pressure. It's uh, again, if you have carbon buildup or you have a, a hot day or anything, you can if you're pretty close to pressure, you're going to you're going to have a bad day. Yeah, I've made the mistake before of getting a load all ready to go. And then I go out a month later in the middle of the day when it's hot and I'm like, oh, great, we're starting over now because <laughs> because suddenly that's yeah. over pressure. Well, Eric, it is an absolute privilege to get to talk to you and call you a friend. I've learned a ton of different things from you um, and enjoy watching it on your channel. So thanks for taking a minute to talk with us. Yeah, man, I appreciate it and I hope it helps.